This episode of After School was written and narrated by Robert Pantano, the writer and creator of Pursuit of Wonder. Check out more videos on Pursuit of Wonder's YouTube channel. Our knowledge, our conditions, and our capabilities as a species have and continue to progress at unfathomable rates. And yet, with each new generation in the modern world, it seems as though we have and continue to sink into greater states of hopelessness and cynicism. It is no secret that an underlying tension between each new generation, from Gen X to Millennial, Millennial to Gen Z, and almost certainly whatever is next to come, is an increasing degree of pessimism that makes the previous generation look almost bubbly and naive. Displays of this can be found in media, in art, in advertising, and in humor, as things like irony and doomerism pervade more and more over time. To paraphrase 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, optimism is dead, and we have killed it. Fundamentally, so many of us have outgrown more comfortable, short-sighted narratives and explanations of life. With increasing knowledge and awareness, we have now moved into a new realm in which there appears to be no clear narrative or reason for life at all. What we seem to be left with is an absurdity and meaninglessness to everything. We have reached the top of this world, and yet, we see nothing from it. This is perhaps one of, if not the greatest contemporary issue of humankind. Finding motivation and a sense of meaning during a time in which existence has revealed itself to be, or at least appears to be, meaningless. In order to take any steps towards trying to grapple with this problem of meaninglessness, it can be helpful to take a few steps back, all the way back to the late 19th century, here, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche would find himself positioned at the forefront of the disintegration of meaning in the Western world. A primary aim of his life's work would become centered on this problem. At the foundation of Nietzsche's philosophy was the recognition that there is no universal objective truth to be known or discovered in life. There are no facts, only interpretations, he wrote. Nietzsche denied the very construct of any sort of truth with a capital T, and suggested, rather, that all attempts to find one are misguided and are what prevent modern man from rediscovering any meaning in life. The pursuit of universal objectivity or meaning in the world beyond this one takes the spirit out of the present earthly human experience of meaning, which is inherently subjective, independent, and expressive. From here, Nietzsche argued that the individual should thus turn away from dependence on any universalities, collective experiences, or cultural mechanisms for meaning, and instead, he placed the creation of meaning squarely in the hands of the individual, suggesting that it is found in the personal pursuit of creative expression and subjective greatness. This philosophy would be embodied in what Nietzsche would term the Ubermensch, or Overman, which he would first introduce in his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The Overman is described by Nietzsche as a sort of defiant, confident, independent individual who pursues their personal desires with vigor and dignifies their independent beliefs unapologetically. Someone who deviates from the collective, exhibits strategic selfishness, and acts with a sort of aggressiveness and grandiosity. These characteristics were justified in Nietzsche's view by the fact that a new morality that opposed the moral views rooted in Christianity, which praised weakness and modesty, was needed to better suit the natural condition of the human experience which he believed involved the desire for vigor, power, and greatness. This view is not without reasonable critiques and unreasonable misinterpretations. However, perhaps what is more important than Nietzsche's definition of the overman is what the concept serves to represent. In slightly broader terms, Nietzsche sets up the overman to function as a sort of idealized version of oneself, an image of a perfect and powerful being who has overcome all their fears and deficiencies, which one can and should set goals to strive toward. Of course, as an ideal, it can never truly be reached, but that is functionally the point. The desire and striving toward the ideal of the overman serve as perpetual fuel for the process of self-growth as one works through a continuous cycle of self-dissatisfaction, self-improvement, and self-rediscovery, over and over. For Nietzsche, this process, which you would term self-overcoming, is fundamental to answering and resolving the problem of meaning and value in life. So long as one establishes one's goals of growth in the name of what one deems to be an idealized, life-affirming version of themselves, this process transmutes life into something worthwhile and personally redeemable. If we have our own why in life, we shall get along with almost any how, Nietzsche wrote. Several decades later, 20th century writer and philosopher Albert Camus would come into the picture, largely picking up the baton from Nietzsche. What makes Camus' insights worth stopping at on the topic of meaning is the way in which he defined and engaged with the problem. Camus defined humanity's relationship with the universe and our pursuit of meaning within it as the absurd. Camus writes, If I see a man armed only with a sword attack a group of machine guns, I shall consider his act to be absurd. 
but it is solely by virtue of the disproportion between his intention and the reality he will encounter, of the contradiction I notice between his true strength and the aim he has in view. From the simplest to the most complex, the magnitude of the absurdity will be in direct ratio to the distance between the two terms of my comparison. The absurd is essentially a divorce. It lies in neither of the elements compared. It is born of their confrontation. In other words, neither humanity nor the universe is necessarily absurd on its own, but rather, their relationship is absurd. As we exist with and act out on our innate desire for meaning, reason, and order, the universe responds with none of the above. Thus, what we want and expect from the universe is fundamentally in contradiction with what we get. Like Nietzsche, Camus rejects the nihilistic hopelessness that might sound like a reasonable conclusion from this, and instead, somewhat deviating from Nietzsche, Camus provokes the absurdity of life as a means of finding worthy and potent experience within it. For Camus, to become aware of and accept the absurdity of life is to transcend it. In being conscious and appreciative of the absurdity, we can more freely look for, find, and create things that are interesting and personally meaningful. For Camus, continuing on in life and using its absurdity as a means of virtue, exploration, art, and unique experience is perhaps the highest and most worthy achievement. It is thus the absurdity of life that makes it worth living in the first place. Furthermore, Camus suggested that in recognizing our absurdity, we can better accept and share value with other people because we can better understand that all people are struggling victims of the absurd. Although these concepts from Nietzsche and Camus are very useful, there are still of course significant challenges to creating one's own meaning. One especially difficult challenge is deciding how to go about doing so. With essentially an infinite number of choices and combinations of choices for how to determine one's ideal self, what to strive for, and what to do with the absurdity of everything, the anxiety of choosing properly can be difficult to bear. Ironically though, the choice we make here, in reaction to the anxiety of choice, is perhaps the most important choice of all. Around the same time as Camus, and following a similar thread of thought as both Camus and Nietzsche, the work of 20th century French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre helps provide us with useful insights and motivation for getting over this hurdle. Sartre argued that since, in his view, we are not created with a specific purpose prior to existence, we create our purpose through the choices and actions we take in life. Man, Sartre writes, is nothing else but what he purposes. He exists solely insofar as he realizes himself. He is therefore nothing else but the sum of his actions, nothing else but what his life is. Since this responsibility can be so overwhelming, the easier knee-jerk response is just not choosing. To mindlessly assimilate popular beliefs, follow standard routes of life, and deflect nearly all the responsibility of choice onto others. Sartre referred to this, however, as bad faith, a form of lying to ourselves and denying our basic freedom. In other words, it is a short-term attempt to dampen the anxiety of being that in turn costs us our authentic self and experience of life. Even choosing to not choose is still a choice. There is no escaping the requirements of choice, and this is perhaps the fundamental existential determination, to choose or not to choose. In this choice, one either harnesses the anguish of human freedom or relinquishes it either builds a life of intention or lives a life of complacency. Sartre, Camus, Nietzsche, and many others unmentioned saw the ground crumbling underneath them and made it part of their life's work to preserve some of the foundation for us. What we are left with now, and perhaps what we will be left with for a very long time, is merely that foundation, on which we must build our own homes. We must realize that this condition is not barren, but ripe for opportunity that it permits us to no longer be subservient to some specific grand meaning or template of life that we don't have to discover or join in on someone else's ultimate answer. Rather, we can and should attempt to create and build in this world using the blueprints of our own design. It is, of course, all incredibly hard and complicated, but the challenge found in this, in the whirlpool of uncertainty, absurdity, and responsibility, is perhaps the unavoidable price of the great gift that we are all given at birth. To face up to the abyss, to feel the anguish of choice and potentiality, to bear the weight of self, all are but visceral, humbling, and beautiful reminders of the potency of life running through our veins. We are perhaps the only stop on this evolutionary train that is outside the tunnel of darkness, able to take the material of everything and make it into something beautiful, or helpful, or interesting, to understand and create the meaning of meaning itself, and to do so just because we can, because the universe for some reason, gave us a blank page to write on. We hope you enjoyed this collaboration. 
It was comprised of a few modified excerpts from my book, The Art of Living a Meaningless Existence. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check it out. It's a collection of essays that journey through philosophy and grapple with ideas and topics similar to this video. The link for it is in the description below.